thank you for the introduction, John. Uh, that uh, program that you mentioned uh, was put together by the EPA because they recognized that lakefront properties represent uh, significant challenges in that they are typically small lots right on the, the water and they don't typically have the best soil or space for a conventional type septic system. And that that is very common uh, throughout the United States. Those conditions at lakefront properties are very consistent. And that throughout the country, different regions, uh, there had been innovations in septic system technologies to address this, the common problem of the small lakefront lot. And the EPA recognized the value of bringing an example of all of those different types of systems to one central location to help expedite uh, the, the use of the different approaches to solve the same problem. So I would like to, let's see here. I would like to share my video. Okay, share screen. Let's see. Share. Okay, sorry about that, folks. We are, okay, here we are. So I'd like to uh, get started and give you a little history about myself and how I got into this, because I think that the story, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting and it's pretty common. Uh, I grew up on Goodyear Lake. My parents uh, bought a house on the lake when I was very young. Goodyear Lake is part of a river system. Uh, it's downstream. It's almost the headwaters of the Susquehanna. And when we moved in to our lakefront house, there had been direct sewer discharges in the Susquehanna River upstream of the lake. And the lake was very contaminated. It was dirty and you really couldn't swim in it. It was so bad that in 1974, the EPA issued a report saying that the contaminant levels in the lake were at a level that we should limit human exposure. That had a profound effect on me because I got to witness firsthand when the direct sewer discharges were eliminated that the lake being part of the river system cleaned up very fast. I witnessed that as a, as a very young person. And I've, I've known since a very young age that I wanted to help protect the uh, water quality and clean up you know, sanitary wastewater. I took a job implementing uh, this EPA grant in the early 2000s. And our, our, uh, the process was to travel around the country to the places where the innovations in the septic system technologies had taken place and like I said, bring it to one central location. Because <clears throat> it, these lakefront lots have a lot in common, whether it's the St. Lawrence River or through the Finger Lakes or any of the thousands of lakes in New York State. The small lakefront lots typically have poor soils or small, and rock is, uh, is more times than not present. So let's talk about how a, a conventional septic system is designed to work. This slide shows uh, the wastewater from the house going through a septic tank where you get primary settling. The settled effluent goes through a distribution box, which splits the flow to several leach fields, leach lines. And in these leach lines, basically, you have soil particles, stone. And in between the stone particles, there's void space. In that void space, you've got oxygen, the naturally occurring microorganisms in the waste 
consume the available oxygen and through the respiratory process, they stay alive and they digest the organics. In a nutshell, that's biodegradation. In addition, these conventional systems are designed and cited such that there's an appropriate distance from receptors. That is a vertical separation to groundwater and a horizontal separation to surface water. And those separation distances have been established to offer a factor of safety such that the water that goes into the ground has to travel a certain distance before it reaches those receptors. Because studies have shown that uh, the contaminants will filter out through dry soil, but once they reach water, groundwater, uh, they can migrate great distances. So as a result of that <clears throat> EPA program, uh, the EPA published some results and there's a case study write up available online, but also the findings from this project uh, produced analytical data uh, in, uh, in a report that was utilized by the State Health Department and the DEC in updating their design standards for uh, individual residential systems and commercial systems. So it was a valuable tool to the design community. And since that time, I have been the owner of Onsite Engineering and our company uh, designs and supervises the installation of septic systems. We sell and service wastewater equipment And what we're, what we're finding is that if the site doesn't have the, the type of soil and the size that's necessary to have a conventional type system, it doesn't have the surface area in, in the leach field to provide that space for the biological treatment. We will achieve the uh, biodegradation in a treatment tank. And this is one example of what a treatment tank would look like. The domestic wastewater from the house would, uh, would come into the tank. This particular tank has four compartments and it provides for anaerobic digestion as well as aerobic digestion. There is a linear air compressor, this green is labeled air blower, provides uh, low pressure air uh, that will help uh, these aerobic microorganisms, uh, you know, provides oxygen so they can stay alive and most importantly, uh, consume and digest the organics. We can put one of these in tank uh, treatment systems at you know, various locations. I'm gonna go through and show you one case study uh, example of where we've applied the use of this type of system on an island that's essentially, uh, well, it's rock, uh, right there in Chippewa Bay. This is Elm Tree Island. And I think the picture pretty well sums it up. Uh, it's, there's a lot of rock here. It's a beautiful place with lots of rock. So how are you gonna have a, a, a septic system on this island? I mean, that's the question folks have, <laughs> you know, have been asking uh, since the first people went to these islands. You know, building the house, was a challenge, you know? I mean, there's no basement here, right? It's, it's sitting on rock, lots of rock. And I, I feel that we, we found a, a good solution here. This is the previous system. Uh, it was installed in 2016. I think everybody knows what happens in uh, 2017. And uh, this is the result. They made an attempt to haul in some sand and have the septic tank effluent, you know, go through these 
uh, aerobic mats and, and filter through the sand. Uh, but when the flood waters came, it all just kind of washed away. That system was uh, over here where you see my cursor. So our solution for this was to in, install one of these, these treatment tanks. So the domestic wastewater would enter the tank and the water coming out the other end would essentially be, be clean. And you can see here, we built a little wood frame area and put the tank right on the rock. We uh, spray foamed around the void space between the wood enclosure. And then we put some vinyl siding that uh, looks like rock around it. And it essentially sits, it sits on the rock and it's insulated to the, to the extent that it won't freeze in the winter. So what happens for this system is there's a small ejector pump that lifts the water up into the treatment tank, which is the first two of these lids. It's one lid here, and then the water serpentine through that unit, and it flows by gravity out of that treatment tank, and it goes through, uh, it's subjected to ultraviolet light, which sterilizes any microorganisms that are left in that treated water so they can't reproduce. And then this third manway, there's a pump in there. And that pump <laughs> conveys the water to the other end of the island where we disperse of it, which represents uh, another challenge. How do you get a force main from one end of a rock to the other. Well, what we did was we we strapped the force main on the underside of the deck here, um, and that got us uh, on the other side of the house. And then we kind of buried it in the weeds uh, the best we could to conceal its location. And for the final dispersal, what we did was we picked a real high spot. So the next time there's a flood, uh, we're well above it. And the owner doesn't have to spend more money to redo what's been washed away due to the high water. So we, we took some rocks that are very similar to the, the ones found on this island and we built a rock wall and we filled in on the high side of the wall with some sand and we put a manifold of PVC piping that has uh, holes in it spaced evenly throughout the length of the laterals. And when the pump turns on, it sprays water out of those laterals, evenly distributes it across the footprint of this dispersal area. So now the treated water that's been disinfected is applied evenly across the footprint of this dispersal area. And it ultimately goes through a bed of sand, washed concrete sand, that we, we hauled out here in, in, in big uh, uh, like feed bags, for the lack of a better term. Uh, they're big sacks that can be loaded on a barge uh, with an excavator and unloaded in the same manner so that there isn't a lot of mess. You can place the bag in the area where you want the aggregate and, and, and it doesn't provide um, a lot of mess. So, you know, on-site engineering has been providing these types of solutions to challenging lakefront lots uh, all over New York State. We've worked from the St. Lawrence River to the tip of Long Island. And we make ourselves available to do site visits and provide owners with a bit of an evaluation on what the options would be at their site. I mean, there's, there's common uh, challenges 
uh, but all of these designs are very much site specific. So we, we offer to come out and look at properties and feel free to contact me. My information is readily available. I guess at this time, I'd like to open it up to questions. Thanks, Eric. Nice talk. Uh, so we have the first question. Uh, again, if anybody is joining us, um, if you would like to submit a question at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab and you can submit your questions through that. Um, so the first question, Eric, is how does this septic system survive under extreme cold and freezing during the winter? That's a good question because there's no faking it. Uh, when it gets cold, the water freezes. When the water freezes, it expands. If uh, water freezes in a container that doesn't have void space and there's no room for expansion, things break. It, it's predictable. It happens every time. Uh, so to the best of our ability, we create a situation where uh, the water either uh, doesn't freeze. Well, we, let, me, let me rephrase that. We create a situation where there isn't water in a force main, for instance. The force main at that, that site on Elm Tree Island is uh, drained at the end of the season because there's some bellies in that piping and uh, it doesn't drain by gravity. Okay, so we blow out the lines so they don't freeze over the winter. So there's no water in the pipe, so the pipe can't, it, it can't, you know, it's not gonna, it's not full of water, so therefore it wouldn't break uh, when it freezes. The tank uh, is insulated to the point where uh, it, it may freeze to some level, but there's enough void space in that tank so that the frozen water, when it expands, it doesn't break anything. We've got this, that particular type of treatment tank at locations where uh, part of the tank is exposed in the Northern Adirondacks where it gets real cold. Uh, you know, we've got these tanks where, you know, the top 12 inches of the tank is out of the ground. They couldn't set it in the ground because of bedrock and they couldn't reach it uh, with aggregate to put over the tank to insulate it from, you know, from the elements. And we believe that tank has frozen solid every single winter, uh, you know, with temperatures 30 below zero. But when we open it up and look at it uh, in the spring, there's nothing broken. So the water freezes, but there's room for expansion and therefore we're not in a situation where it's a bunch of broken piping. Uh, the next question up is, what is the typical cost of an installation like this? Well, we expected to have that question. Uh, you know, well, we're, we're talking about the island sites. Let, let's talk about that uh, for a minute. I, I believe the, the case study we just showed for Elm Tree, I believe the installation was... Uh, around $30,000 with the equipment being uh, somewhere around 8,000. Um, so those are give or take a couple thousand in either direction. Uh, those aren't exact numbers, but ballpark. The cost of working on an island is directly related to the uh, ability to unload uh, in the location where you could unload the materials. So if there's a landing site that's right next to where the work is actually uh, taking place, uh, it's, it's much, much easier uh, and less expensive. And in a nutshell, on the mainland, uh, this type of system would be about, say, ballpark on average, $20,000. You know, the equipment being about maybe, you know, eight to 10,000 and the installation being eight to 10. Uh, and with that said, we've had a lot of cases that, you know, the installed cost was uh, $15,000. Uh, 
we had a program uh, in Lake George where we put in, you know, uh, 15 or 20 of these types of tanks at uh, neighboring properties. And we just did tank replacements. And the association has a report out there demonstrating that the installed cost was, you know, 12 to 18,000, something like that. Thanks. Uh, the next question is if the water has been treated and sterilized through the treatment tank and ultraviolet, why is the sand dispersal distribution area still needed? Well, that's a, uh, that's a great question. Okay. And when I was working with this EPA program, I posed the same question, uh, to you know, high level regulators at the state health department. And the, the, the point is, <clears throat> if you believe in the technology and the data and you have confidence that it's gonna work, why can't we just pump it into the surface water? And it, it's uh, not ever gonna happen uh, unless the attitude changes here in New York. They want a factor of safety. And there's an, an enormous uh, benefit to filtering of the clean water through a porous media. Uh, <clears throat> if there's an upset in the treatment process, the system that we showed there doesn't uh, really lend itself to upsets. It's a very consistent uh, means of treating the water, but a lot of these systems are subject to upset. You know, uh, folks on medication, for instance, could, uh, you know, the pharmaceuticals get in there and they, they create a problem with uh, certain types of mixed liquor systems. So there, you know, there, is periodic upsets. So for that reason, I think that the direct discharges uh, aren't typically allowed. Uh, they are permitted through the Speedies program with the DEC, but for single family residential properties, it's uh, less and less common every day. Great. Uh, we've got a couple of people asking, what is the maintenance on the system? So I should say that there's uh, quite a few different types of in-tank treatment units, okay? I showed you the picture of one and uh, our company has been involved in, you know, the sale and service of half a dozen different types of units. All of the treatment units are, are different, okay? Some are short and fat and some are tall and skinny. And what we do as a designer uh, is we try to pair up the challenges of a particular location with the attributes that, that best suit that installation, uh, the attributes of a specific treatment system. So we try to pair up the best technology for a particular site. Um, all of the, the treatment systems, um, they all do the same thing and use basically the same process. That's natural biodegradation. They're, they're creating an environment where these naturally occurring microorganisms can, can stay alive long enough to digest the organics. So with, with that said, they're all different. Uh, the system that I showed, uh, the, the cutaway of uh, the, the annual service, it's fairly straightforward. It, uh, the manufacturer recommends that the, the lids are removed and uh, water samples are collected in each of the four compartments. And uh, a, wa a, a visual water quality evaluation is performed. And using you know, litmus strips, we, we test for uh, some of the uh, parameters like nitrates and, and that type of thing to get an idea of, you know, how healthy the, uh, the, the treatment process is. But there's an, also a flushing out of the systems by opening a, a number of different valves and just flushing water in case there's, you know, built up, um, you know, material in the pipes. The service on that system that we showed 
uh, really the annual service doesn't take much more than a half an hour. It's very straightforward. That's why we, we tend to uh, gravitate to using that type of system because it's, it's very easy on the maintenance. In fact, uh, that system is sold with um, two years of, of annual service included in the purchase price. Wonderful. Uh, and okay, the so cost, I, let me just add that the cost after that uh, is a couple hundred dollars a year after that two year period. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions. I think I'm going to do one more here live and then we can move the other ones for you to answer uh, later. But the last question that we've got for right now is can you consult and sell into Canada? Wow, um, I'm gonna jump ahead and say yes, okay? Uh, but I don't know that, uh, but I will I, I will find a way. Of course we can do that. Uh, the Canadians uh, have, uh, they have their eye on the environment, uh, very much so. And they have, um, one of the companies that we worked with uh, was, was Canadian. So we're, we're very certain that they support this type of technology. And uh, if, I, if I personally can't, uh, I can certainly connect the interested party with somebody that can. Yeah. 